That's fun. Are we doing this live? Yeah, let's do it live. Cause it's, uh, are you good with that? Are you okay doing it on Facebook Live? Okay. okay. I guess but, so. Sure, yeah. why not? Because it's, um, it's not like it's, you're going to edit it anyhow. Right. I never do. <laughs> right? Right? I, that's right. I Jim said a really stupid thing. We must edit that out. Correct? <laughs> no, Jim said it. He can take the heat for that. <laughs> Have you taken the heat for something you said? No. Oh. Okay. Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's told him yet. I think because everybody understands there, but for the grace of God, go I, you know? There you go. That... <laughs> That and everybody around here is super passive aggressive anyway. Well, right. So. <laughs> yeah. They won't say it to your face. They'll just. Uh... <laughs> this episode is brought to you commercial free by Getty's Bike Tours. Spring is here and it's time to visit Gettysburg, and there's no better way to experience your history than by a bike tour with Getty's Bike. Mention addressing Gettysburg when you call to book and receive 15% off. So call 717 752 7752 and book today. Getty's Bike Tours. Think outside the bus. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. I knew what I was doing there, Eric. Did you? Yeah, you didn't think I did. Oh, man. I saw you panicking. Press the button. Press the button. What are you doing? Press the button. Why aren't you pressing the button? You're just sitting there. (laughs) Well, that's part of the the, uh, wonder for the people on Facebook watching us live is they get to see how the sausage is made, you see? (laughs) What was that face, Mike? Who wouldn't want to see how the sausage gets made? (laughs) What, what, Mike? What are you laughing at? What? Yeah, I'm with Eric. On you, you don't want to see the sausage getting made? Well, you just did. You just witnessed it. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, this uh, Ask a Gettysburg Guide. We like to do this, I don't know, once a quarter, maybe? It's yeah, our it's our like Q2. Every once in a while. Uh, uh, yeah, but it's not coming out until like Q3. I don't know. I might, I might push it up because of what I'm about to say. Oh, I might push enough. it up. We just had our first get out of the car tour this weekend. We had 50 people, Eric. 50 we people. Did. Yeah. And um, that was uh, that was about 15 more than I expected. It's 15 more than our average of last year. And it's exactly how many I expected. And Eric called it. So, Eric, you know what you get? Do you know what you get, oh, Eric? do I get a Dan Butterfield? Dan, Dan, Dan Butterfield, Butterfield, Butterfield. Yeah, you God. called it, baby. Um, yeah, that was great. We had a lot of fun. Uh, I did, at least. I don't know. Mike Lynch, you were on it. You tell me. Did you have fun? Absolutely. Did you learn anything? A lot. Seeing the Forbes Rock from that perspective was phenomenal. The- also, don't know you could go up there and actually sit cross-legged on it. So, <laughs> thanks to uh, one of the Mike, other Mike. listener Mike's up there, kind of doing the Rafiki up there. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, <laughs> And I didn't know that was him. I saw him up there and uh, later on found out that that was him. I had no idea. Um, I don't even I didn't know even, what you guys are talking well, about. Well, we I don't want to embarrass the guy and say his name on the air. So, uh, you know. I had the dog. <laughs> you had the right. You yeah, had the dog. Had the damn dog. And it was nice. It was. It, it was, was nice. Good. It was a good time. So thank you to everyone who came out. Um, and, oh, and then we went to Mason Dixon. Thank you to Mason Dixon for sponsoring it. We went to Mason Dixon afterwards, and. Uh, uh, about 35 or 36 people came yeah. over there too, which was yeah. great because that, uh, that makes it worth it for everybody that, uh, that, uh, those people came out. So you guys are really an awesome, uh, crowd and thank you very much for all the support and all the things that you do for, for us. And it helps us keep this stuff going. And, uh, thank you once again today, we are doing, uh, homeless questions as we, uh, often like to do. And those of you watching on Facebook live, We'll get to your questions. If you have any questions, put them in the comment section, and when we're done, we're going to get to them. But we're going to get right into them now with our special guest guide, everybody's favorite, Jim Pangburn. Thank you, Jim. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, guys. It's great to be here. Um, Always great to have you. You know that. We love having you on. Uh, Jim, let's get into some of these homeless questions. There's no background to give today because we're not talking about one specific thing. These are questions that had no home on previous episodes of uh, Ask a Guide. And, uh, and uh, yeah. I mean, about if, very... if you remember back in the olden times, mm-hmm. no, I uh, do. this is the way we did all of them. It was just... This is the original yeah. format of the Ask a Guide Something show. Like the first nine yeah. or so. We would just do like a shotgun approach or to, yeah. you know, just throw all these questions at the guide. Yeah. But then, then when, see, this is, this is how things, 
you know, uh, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Uh, we lose our studio because of the coronavirus. We couldn't go in the building anymore. Yeah. And it coincided with spring. And yeah. so we said, well, let's go out on the battlefield. Well, since we're going out on the battlefield, let's do shows about specific yeah. spots on the battlefield. And then once we came into the studio, we just kept doing that about a certain subject. But once yeah. in a while, people don't understand that when we say... We want questions about John Gordon, for example, mm -hmm. and they send in a question about <laughs> about like Elijah Hunt Rhodes, and it's like, well, okay, it doesn't fit in what, but I'm going to put it aside, and that's what we do. So anyway, these are those questions here. Okay, Jim, here we go. Bob Fleming says, from what I've read and heard, Iverson did not put out skirmishers. I don't believe that's normal, but was this completely uncommon? Would his subordinates have the right to put them out at the regimental level? Uh, that's a terrific question. Um, it was very uncommon. Normally, you would, uh, when you're about to go into battle, you send about a tenth of your regiment, uh, like a company, uh, 40, 50 men out on a skirmish line to make contact with the enemy, to draw fire from the enemy. Uh, you're able to pin down their position, uh, get an idea of the strength of the enemy, and, and give your own force uh, warning, uh, acting like a tripwire that there's going to be a battle. So it kind of kind of acts like a buffer before the two sides meet. And it was very unusual. Um, if uh, Iverson didn't put out skirmishers, it was probably because his superior, General Rhodes, uh, was trying to seize the initiative, uh, knew that the Union troops were in the uh, Sheeler Woods, Sheeds Woods, mm -hmm. um, and wanted to seize the initiative, wanted to hit the Union Army uh, before they could push him, Rhodes' division, off of uh Oak Ridge. Uh, sometimes you have flankers, um, and that's what really would have uh, applied to what occurred on July 1st on Oak Ridge. Um, you send a few guys off to the right or left, but most of the skirmishers were out in front of the line. Mm. And what was happening here on July 1st is um, I think Iverson was counting on uh, O'Neill's Alabama Brigade to protect his left down below Oak Ridge on the left and couldn't really see them and didn't realize that when he went forward, that O'Neill had been repulsed near the Mummersburg Road. Mm -hmm. And that as he moved forward across the Mummersburg Road toward the Sheets Woods, that uh, he had no support on his left. And the Union troops had come up behind Oak Ridge and perhaps through the Sheets Woods and, and gotten behind a stone wall on Iverson's left. And so they didn't detect him until it was too late. Suddenly the Union troops arose on Iverson's left and essentially bushwhacked yeah. Iverson's uh, brigade. So, so, so you would uh, you would argue that if they had if he had put out flankers, um, that would have saved or helped give yeah, some kind it, of warning. It, it might have alerted the rest of the uh, the brigade to what was going on. I don't know if they did or not, uh, but you know, there's a lot of smoke on the battlefield, mm -hmm. and you can't really see anyhow. And most of the Union troops were behind a wall and a ridge behind that. And I think uh, Iverson was concerned with what was straight ahead of him in the woods he was headed toward. Right. Um, so I think if if he did not put skirmishers out in front of him. Um, and I think I've heard that. Uh, it was because it was an imp impetuous attack, and, and Rhodes was anxious to seize the initiative and wanted to hit the Yankees and drive them back before they could drive him off of Oak Ridge. Okay. All right. Uh, the next one is Balthazar. He says, what happened and who was Coster's brigade facing at the Brickyard? So I guess he wants to know about the Brickyard fight and who was Coster up against. Coster's brigade consisted of 27th Pennsylvania 154th New York, 134th New York. They were originally part of the reserve that Howard left on Cemetery Hill on July 1st. And when the Union right at Barlow's Knoll, north, northeast of town, was overlapped, Coster's brigade was sent, small brigade, was sent to the northeast of town uh, where Coon's Brickyard is to form a line to cover the retreat of the Union 11th Corps, Barlow's division specifically, uh, back through town. And what happened to them, who they were facing it, uh, primarily is uh, Hayes, Louisianans. Uh, some North Carolinians uh, under Avery. But uh, they had formed a line, and, and in turn, they were overlapped. The Confederates outnumbered them pretty heavily, and the 134th New York, I believe it was, was on the far right of Coster's Brigade, and they were just simply overlapped. Uh, when you go to Coster's uh, Avenue today, that small block of land that the park owns, and you look at the mural done by Mark Dunkelman, um, you can see on the far left-hand side, you can see Confederates kind of coming over a fence and flanking mm. uh, the mm. Union line up there. Yeah. So that line was in turn flanked, and then uh, down Stratton Street, Coster's Brigade went, and of course, uh, that's where um, Humiston 
Amos Humiston got wounded. Right, and and so he had a follow-up question about that. Besides Amos Humiston, what were some other unique 11th Corps town fighting uh, stories, I guess, on the 1st and 3rd in Gettysburg? You know, I was reading that uh, question last night, um, trying to prepare for this, and I, first I had a hard time thinking of any. Um, there are a couple. Um, of course, Humiston is probably the most famous. Uh, he's retreating down Stratton Street, gets wounded, realizes he's dying, pulls out the photo of his three children, and later they use the photo to identify him. But um, the two things that come to mind, a lot of people are familiar with uh, General Schemmelfinning mm-hmm. of the 11th Corps. Mm-hmm. And he's retreating probably down the alley on the west side of Baltimore Street. I forget what the name of the alley is, but uh, Confederates were coming down the alley after him. He jumped over a fence into the backyard of a... Uh, Garlic. I was just going to say Garlic, yeah. but I wasn't sure it was her. Anna Garlic? I'm not sure either. And uh, she lived close, but in any case, uh, he hides under a... Uh, like a woodshed or a pig sty. That's it. Like there's, it was near a pig nobody, sty. It was yeah. a woodshed. And he hid there for several days, and she came out and gave him food. Uh, he didn't make it quite into the Union lines in Cemetery Hill. He's still just within the, the town, uh, the southern edge of town, and he's within the Confederate lines. But he evades capture by hiding in that, in that woodshed area. Um, the other thing that I thought of was the story, the one that always kind of impressed me was, I think it's the 45th New York under Colonel Dobke, and they were some of the first 11th Corps guys out north of town on July 1st, and they were the ones that kind of went out toward the McLean farm uh, and first made contact with the Confederates. Um, they end up retreating back through what is the college today, mm-hmm. and they end up, at this point, Union First Corps guys are coming down Chambersburg Street, and they're in the area of uh, Washington in Chambersburg Street, about a block west of the square, kind of near where the 7-Eleven is today. Yeah. And in some of those houses, like where the the Blue Parrot used to be mm. and where, mm. um, uh, what's his name, the attorney, Thaddeus Stevens, had his law office, that area, okay. they were hiding in some of those houses. Yeah. Uh-huh. And the Confederates come in and they surround the area, you know, and there's a negotiation going on. You guys need to surrender. You're surrounded. And the Yankees aren't quite, you know, they don't believe it. And, <laughs> and the Confederates say, well, we'll allow you to come out and take a look. And so some of these union guys came out, officers, whatever, came out and took, looked around and realized that they were surrounded yeah. on Chambersburg Street there and then did end up surrendering. Um, but a lot of it, it's hard to pick out a lot of the 11th Corps stuff because so many 1st Corps guys are coming down from the West and intermingling uh, with the 11th Corps guys. But another thing I thought of uh, last night when I was looking at that question is um, there was a barricade that was constructed on Carlisle Street between the square and the railroad station and where the Lincoln Diner is today, mm-hmm. near the rail, where the railroad tracks are. Um, that was kind of interesting that the Union Army had a chance to actually build a barricade, slow the Confederate pursuit, um, and slow the Conf- uh, Union guys down on their way back to Cemetery Hill to the south. Uh, the other thing I thought of is the picture I've had of the, the number of Union troops, probably both corps intermingled, going down Baltimore Street. And they said there were so many of them that they went from uh, building on one side of the street to the building on the other oh, side. Oh, I'd imagine. So it's shoulder to shoulder. Yeah. I mean, you can hardly move because you're just you know gridlocked to all these troops. Oh, yeah. it's it's got to be unbelievable. Like trying to get out of a Yankees game, you know, <laughs> or something like that. You know, everybody's all jammed together trying to get to that little turnstile or whatever the heck it is. Um, but those are the things <laughs> yeah. that I think of uh, with the 11th Corps and the first day that, that was going on. Just so much chaos and confusion <clears throat> in the streets of town. I'm sure there's hundreds, thousands of stories that you know, or hidden somewhere in an attic in some diary or something that we haven't even heard yet, I hope. Cause Lots of interesting stories of the way the citizens tried to hide Union soldiers yeah. in the houses from the Confederates and, and the interactions uh, the Confederates had both with the residents and any Union uh, prisoners they captured in some of the houses. So, uh, lots of good stories. Who was, the, who was, the, uh, who was it that was, um, they were in the basement and they saw the uh, soldier, Union soldier get killed? And then, so, you know, the Confederates came and rifled through his pockets and stuff. And then the father went out and wrapped him in a blanket and then went back down in into the basement. And uh, then later more Confederates came and rifled through his pockets. And, and this went on for a while until he finally said, forget it. I'm just going to leave him there. Do you remember who that who that was? Was that the was that was that the Garlax or I don't remember that. Or the Shrivers, Eric? Was it on the Shriver House tour? Well, that it couldn't have been the Shrivers because oh, he they was were in down. the army. Okay, yeah. No, but so maybe it was... Who the hell was it? Who was it? I'm not sure. But you know the story. You've heard the story. 
right? I don't you think I've heard that particular yeah. one. I've heard that type of story. I don't remember yeah. that particular. Yeah. Yeah. Someone like in the audience, audience, someone I, in the audience knows, and they'll keep watch the comments. They'll, I know the wheel lock story from the Sheed's house. You know, I thought about that one, Eric, but that's ninety seventh. Yeah, that's and, first core. That's first core. Yeah, exactly. They're up on Oak Ridge, close to the eleventh core line there. Yeah. But um, I thought that's one of my thought about. And then uh, the uh, Union Chaplain was it Hal Horatio Henry Hal? Yeah, that was on the steps of the Christ yeah, Church. Yeah. He's buried at Greenwood Cemetery. Now, what unit was he associated with? Is anybody? I'm not sure. I can't remember. Oh, was the, wasn't it the 97? I'm thinking he's first core. He was first yeah. core. Okay, yeah. Yeah. that's why I didn't think of his story because they specifically asked for the 11th core story. So. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's move on then here to uh, Alex Barney. Oh, this is a new name. I don't. I don't think I've heard this no. name before. Well, welcome, Alex. Uh, if you could go anywhere on the battlefield that's off the beaten path, where would you go and why? Interesting question. Not a battle question. This is a gym question. Yeah, I like that question. When I saw that, I really did. <laughs> okay, um, good. But it, it's hard to say. Um, when I thought of the question, I thought uh, he said places that I like to go. So that means places that I like to actually not just see like the Jones Artillery position out on Harrisburg Road, which is mm. behind a nursing home, which is cannons there, which is really cool if you've never seen them. Yeah. Yeah. But there's nothing really to see except in the wintertime. Maybe you can see some of the steeples of the town and get an idea of what it was like in 1863 when it was open. Um, but I thought of things like I'd like to go and just kind of spend time there. And two of them uh, are out on the Hanover Road. And the one that I, I think I like the most is Benner's Hill. Oh, yeah. Because oh, Benner's Hill, spot. it's not far from the town. It's east of town. Um and it's seldom visited, and it's a long road with artillery pieces, and then there's a call to sack, and you can park. But I'll tell you why I really like it, um, in case I shouldn't give this away because it's kind of a private thing. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> will go out there anyhow. Uh, nighttime. Yeah. I love Benner's Hill at nighttime. Now, it's east of town. It's elevated. Yeah. It's up on the Hanover Road. And when, you, when you're up there and you look down, you can see the lights of Gettysburg. <clears throat> kind of reminds me of like being up on Mulholland Drive looking down at the lights of L.A., <laughs> but a smaller <laughs> version of that. But I've always, always liked that a lot. Sure. And then if you go out, you know, I don't know how um, – is it Alex? Alex Barnes? Uh, yeah. yeah, Alex. Like, I don't know if he's ever been out to East Calvary Battlefield. But if you spend the time to take the three miles beyond Benner's Hill and you go out beyond Route 15, you go out to uh, East Calvary, it's pristine out there. Yeah, I, I love it out there. I mean, the only thing that's out there that wasn't out there during the battle are a couple of modern houses, uh, some monuments, mm -hmm. maybe some pavement. Mm -hmm. But I mean, they're still farming the fields out there. It's the way it was. Yeah, Eric and I were out there last spring while they were spraying liquid manure all over the place. Oh, yeah, that, that was, was delightful. That was <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> it was wonderful. But yeah, no, I hear you. Uh, those are those are two of my favorite places to go because you're nobody's there. Nobody knows nobody's about there. them. You might see somebody once in a while, but I know we used to go up there. Uh, friends of mine, we used to go up there and smoke cigars at night. Oh yeah, you know during the summer. Yeah, like we just smoke a cigar or something. Smoke a cigar, cool. watch the sunset. No one's gonna bother. Talk no. Yeah, watch yeah, the sunset. No. Good place yeah. to do that. It's quiet, like you said, Matt. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I love uh, I, I I go up to Benner's Hill quite often. I love it up there. I do too. Yeah, and. Um, Oh, one other place, yeah. South Cavalry Battlefield. Yeah. Down the Emmitsburg Road. Um, if you've never been there, um, you can pull off the side of the road. It's not really easy to do. Yeah. No. But it's near the, I think it's the Battlefield Bed and Breakfast. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of parallel to the little dirt road that takes you back yeah. there. And there's cannons and there's interpreted markers and brigade yeah. markers. And then you can walk on the other side of the road on the west side. That's where yeah. I like and to go. And there's not too many, but a couple of markers. But it's just something if you haven't done before, it's kind of cool. You go down the Emmitsburg Road, you go past Knight Road where the rec recreation vehicles park is and the Bowling Alley, yeah. and past the seven, six, six, six Pennsylvania six, Cavalry. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's it's just before you go downhill as you're headed south, south down, yeah, south yeah. down the Emmitsburg Road. Um, you can see the markers from the road if you slow down, and and so I, I thought about that too. That's a yeah, kind of cool. Place. I love to go to the west side because it's like I just discovered it. Two years ago, mm. I never knew it was there. Mm. I always knew South Calvary Field was there on the east side of the mm -hmm. road because it's obvious, but I never noticed the well, other they, one. Well, they mow a lane. Yeah, yeah. And, and I know. The problem is you can't slow down on that road no. to see it. No. And if you did slow down or you, you managed to pull off the road, then you then you discover it. Yeah, it's you got to it's it's hard to park. You got to know where it is ahead of time because by the time you notice it, you're you're literally passing. Yeah. It. So you have to know ahead of time right. to pull off. That's exactly. I used to live down that road just a, a way, so I used to go up and down that all okay. the time, but. That's where Merritt's guys came up. Yeah. On the Union left flank on the 
uh, the third day before Farnsworth charged. They were yeah. supporting Farnsworth's left. And a lot of people don't know that. But in, in the fields uh, just across from the South End Guide Station, uh, the Confederate right was positioned there facing south. And Merritt's guys came up like almost toward the Eisenhower farm. And, you know, today some of that is yeah. it's just lost. It's not marked very well as far as battle action. But stuff occurred there. Yeah. Uh, going back to the uh, previous one about the people in the basement, uh, Anthony Bordner said he thought it was uh, also the Shrivers as well. And I think I think the confusion, Eric, would be that the Shrivers went with the Garlocks, didn't they? They were in the, or well, they were in they, somebody's they, basement they, other than They went to own. the Garlock basement, right. uh, but the Garlocks weren't there. Okay, so they the were with another left, family. And then they ended up back in uh, their own basement at some point. But the basic premise of the story is that the the guy is going out and wrapping this body. Yeah. Well, he wasn't there. Who? George it's, Shriver. No, but it doesn't have to be George Shriver. That's why I thought I thought they were with another family. That's oh, why no, I thought I that. Uh, well, there, Mrs. Shriver went to Tilly Pierce. Yeah. And said, we're heading south to some relatives or friends for safety on the first day to get away from the fight. Right. Do you want to come with us? Maybe it is the Garlocks that, that stayed. Oh, no, Christ, I don't know. Somebody's got to Google this. Yeah, yeah. Mike, can you Google it on your phone while you're over there? Would you do that, please? Uh, Somebody get Nancy from the Shriver house on the yeah. phone. Yeah, oh, there you go. There call, you go. The, <laughs> call the Shriver house. Uh, we got to set up phones so we could just call things on the air. Uh, all right. Well, in the meantime, we'll move on. The show must go on. Joe Click, Joey Click from uh, out there in uh, Kentucky, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Joe Click, uh, he says, not really a question, but you should ask the guide about General Lee's lost chicken at Gettysburg. He was really upset about his pet chicken missing and deployed men to go find her. Lee was an animal lover and especially loved cats. Which would then go and eat the chicken. I think we found out yeah. where the chicken went. The cat ate there the chicken. There it is. Yes. There it is. The cat ate the chicken, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Joe Click. You answered your own question. Go ahead. <laughs> well, Tell us about that's, the that's probably the toughest question I've had. I mean, I, I'd heard that he had a chicken, pet chicken. I never knew that he was a big cat fan, so that's kind of interesting. I learned something there. But, uh, um, you know, I've read a lot about that, and I, uh, I've never seen much about Lee's chicken at all. I don't doubt maybe he did have a chicken there, supposedly laid an egg for him every day. I've heard something, something about that. I don't know if that's So true. he would have his breakfast with the, yeah. the, from the chicken. So he gets the eggs rather than eating the chicken. But Got uh, it. Um, I, I know very little about that. Uh, there's not a, not a lot that I've seen on Lee's uh, chicken at Gettysburg. Okay. But of course he had, what, two or three horses. He had Traveler and Lucy. and Yeah, Traveler, Lucy, and I was trying to think of the other one. The I can never day. think of the third one. Yeah. Never think of the third one. Call him Reginald. He got me on that one. Uh, okay, Rich Snyder, who uh, I met for the first time, he came on the tour on Saturday. It was nice to meet you, Rich. He says, he's got two questions. One, were captured POWs kept in the area during the battle? I thought I heard once that the Union started sending captured uh, Confederates down towards Westminster during the battle. Now, that question I can answer. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, you know where the Union guys kept the Confederate prisoners? Right across the parking lot from where we are right now. Oh. Um, if you're familiar with the Gettysburg National Military Park Visitor Center on Baltimore Pike, um, it's that big field they cleared a few years ago right across the Baltimore Pike and slightly south. In other words, between Culp's Hill and the Visitor Center. Oh, yeah. If you come out of the Visitor Center, you turn right, you go down to Baltimore Pike. Uh, it's the field on the left. Uh-huh. And it makes sense uh, because um, it's surrounded by trees. They can enclose it. And it was right on the Baltimore Pike, which is the main Union supply line. And he's right. The closest Union railhead was at Westminster. So they marched him down the Baltimore Pike, where they kept him was right along the pike. And now, I don't think they moved him during the battle. Because you have to remember, after the first day's fight, the Union Army only had three roads that they were able to control. The Emmitsburg Road, barely, kind of in between the lines. The Tawnytown Road and the Baltimore Pike, which is the main supply line. Mm -hmm. So you've got messengers coming in and out of the Baltimore Pike. You've got uh, supplies, artillery coming and going, uh, supplies and so forth. So I would think you would keep that road open. It was after the battle, when the battle was over, that they started sending the prisoners down to Westminster to put on trains. Now, as far as the Union captured, the Confederates kept them in those fields, uh, the first day's fields west of town. Okay. Just beyond Meade's, uh, headquarters, Lee's headquarters excuse me, and the seminary. You know how when you're coming over... Um, Seminary Ridge on Route 30 as you leave town, 
uh, that area where Buford's men camped mm -hmm. the night before the battle. So like that little swell between swell. McPherson's Ridge and Seminary Ridge. That's it, Matt. Yeah. My understanding is that's where they kept a lot of them. And they said, I remember <clears> reading one time recently about that, and they said... Um, it was it was disgusting both for the Confederates who were behind the lines on day two and three, and the Union prisoners that were kept back there, uh, because of the stench of the the bodies and the heat from the first day's casualties that mm. were lying there hadn't been buried yet. Oof. And I always think of that. A lot of people probably don't think much of that when they drive through there, but there's uh, Route 30, which is the main line that they took the prisoners and the wounded out on. So it makes sense that they would be close to that road. Right. Um, uh, so same idea as the Union is that they're in a big field by their main route of right. retreat or supply or whatever. But think about this. The Union, the main railhead, the closest railhead for the Union Army that Confederate prisoners have to march to is 25, 30 miles away at Westminster, Maryland. The Union prisoners have to march over South Mountain into the Cumberland Valley, over the Potomac, into the Shenandoah Valley, and the closest Confederate railhead is about 150 miles, 175 miles away at Stanton, Virginia. Oof. But then, flip of the coin, that also tells you something about who can be supplied a lot easier. The Union Army can be supplied by rail 30 miles away, and the Confederate closest railhead's 175 yeah. <laughs> miles away. Again, like the more I learn about the finer details of uh, the war and this battle, I just wonder how the Confederates ever thought they had a chance of winning. Yeah, kind of a, a, a desperate thing, and I, I think they're waving, they're riding the wave of a, a crest of confidence. Yeah, you know they've had, and apparently that goes a long way. Yeah, <laughs> I mean I think it's a mixture of they're confident and they're kind of desperate. Because they've really got to, uh, they've really got to win a, 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 an important battle here on northern soil because I think Lee and they all knew that it was just a matter of time. I think it was attrition. desperation and delusion that uh, is that gave birth to the Confederacy. That's my. Uh, that's my take on the whole thing because <laughs> I just I don't understand. It sounds like, it sounds like part of the country just like lost its mind. It's not that, not that they didn't believe what they were fighting for or anything. It was it was that how do you think you can win a war? And I mean I know in the beginning they were they were winning on the battlefield a lot, but at the end of the day, that's I don't know I think if that's really what wins wars. Probably underestimated the will of the the northern people. In the, the sure. Union Army, overconfidence. Um, yeah, probably thought. Yeah, you know, they'll they'll probably let us go when they see we're serious about this. And um, and then they found out that uh, it was very important to the people of the United States to say uh, single union. Yeah, protect the union. Very strange. Very strange. I don't understand why you would uh, waste so many lives in order to force people who don't want to be with you to stay in. <laughs> In 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 a union with you, like, could you imagine like a married couple doing that? Like, you know, yes, actually, yeah, I could. Yeah. <laughs> they I, use the yeah. children as no, the. I, I used yeah. to be in that marriage. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I really like that question uh, specifically because today, starting today, this afternoon, uh, every day this week, there is a diary that was written by Nathaniel Rollins uh, of the, I think, the Second Wisconsin. But he was captured on July 1st, and there's like a six-day block from July 1st to the 6th where he's talking about his experience as a prisoner. Oh, cool. So those will be posting. Those will be on Facebook. Starting today, it'll be Marvelous. one every day for the rest of this week. Marvelous, Eric. Marvelous. Buena. You know what? Dan, 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 yes. Butterfield, Butterfield, Butterfield. Another one. Look Dan, at me go. Just racking two, them up. Two Dan Butterfields in one show. Good for you. <laughs> uh, all right, so <laughs> Rich had a second question. He says, I have heard that Robert E. Lee contacted George Meade on the 4th to request a prisoner exchange, and Meade refused or said, he did not have the authority to grant the request. Is this true, and was this a practice by the armies before the Battle of Gettysburg? Thanks for the great shows. Best wishes. Um, it's true. Uh, I've seen in the official records that Meade reported that, I think, to Halleck in Washington, that right after the battle, that Lee had proposed a, a prisoner exchange and that he refused it. Hmm. I think he had the authority to do it, but he, he, he chose not to. And I think the reason Lee did that is because he was trying to unencumber himself of the Union prisoners. Um, get some of his guys back, which, you know, later on uh, in another battle might uh, come in real handy. And if they had arranged uh, an exchange of prisoners, and they normally didn't do this right on the battlefield. Normally you took a prisoners and you had exchanges uh, after the battle. Uh, and, they, and, of course, Grant ended that uh, later on in the war in 64. But um, 
uh, you would have to arrange, you know, a meeting place and a formal exchange. And that would be the whole time that's going on. The Confederates are heading over the mountains and getting out of here. Right. So it's, a, it, it's attacked, I think, by Lee to give him to buy himself more time okay. to unencumber himself. He could move his army quicker <coughs> without the Union prisoners. And so Meade, you think thinking Meade smelled that. He, yeah. he knew that's what yeah, he was doing. Yeah. And, I, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure he, he mentioned much about why he refused it, but I'm almost, I'm certain I've seen in the official records that in his report back to Washington immediately after the battle that he mentioned that Lee had asked for a prisoner exchange and then he turned it down. Mm, okay. Uh, all right. So these are from Facebook now. These are people uh, watching live on Facebook and they are putting these questions in the comments. So we haven't looked at them beforehand. What, Eric? I have to say, yes. I asked for questions on Facebook last Thursday. And no one had anything? And nothing. And now all of a sudden, everybody's got questions. Yeah, uh, suddenly What's everybody's up? all curious. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, here we go. So we haven't been able to look at these ahead of time. So Jim, no pressure. If you don't know the answer off the top of your head, just say, I don't know. And that's okay. fine. Uh, and uh, maybe we can, uh, you can find the answer. And maybe we can get it back to the person if they're that interested. That sounds okay? great. Okay, here we go. Bobby Crystal, Billy's son, says... <laughs> Uh, descendant of the uh, 26th PVI, can you tell me a little bit about them and the second division of the Third Corps? Hmm, if Bobby's still watching, can you be a little bit more specific about the second division of the Third Corps? And in the meantime, you want to talk about the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency uh, Volunteers? Okay, we are talking about the Emergency I Volunteers. Think, I, oh, right. no, oh, bo- Volunteer Infantry, sorry. We, we are talking about the Pennsylvania the Volunteer Pennsylvania, Infantry, yeah. yeah. I misspoke. It's 26 PVI. That's what he wants. To it's do. not the emergency. No, sir. guys. No. Then there's nothing I can tell you. <laughs> I could have talked to you about the emergency volunteer. I can tell you about those guys. Talk on it. Well, tell us about those guys while he's getting more specific about the second division of the third corps question. Well, the 26th emergency volunteers uh, really weren't part of the Army of the Potomac. They were pretty much local guys here in the Gettysburg area. A lot of them, um, I believe, were uh, students at, at Gettysburg College, which were hanging around for the summer, and they were scraped up. Uh, it was in response to the Confederate invasion. The Confederates are already in Pennsylvania. The Union Army is still down, you know, kind of guarding Washington. The Confederates are already uh, hunting for horses and stuff in the mountains. And so they scraped these guys together. They sent them up to Harrisburg. Mm-hmm. And they handed them rifles and they trained them for about a week. Mm-hmm. And they rushed them back down here by train. And the train actually hit a cow between yeah. Gettysburg and New Oxford. And then they got to Gettysburg on the 26th of Friday of June, five days before the battle. And it was a uh, light rain and they sent them out uh, the uh, Chambersburg Road uh, to meet the Confederates. They camped near Marsh Creek. Um, and when they saw the Confederates coming down the road on uh, June 26th, Gordon's Brigade of Georgians, they basically threw their rifles and ran for Harrisburg. Uh, ran north, northeast of Gettysburg, all the way up to the area of Lisburn, um, up above um, Dillsburg area. Um, and of course, there's a story of Jubal Early capturing some of them and lecturing him in the town square of Gettysburg that you boys should go home and to your, your mothers or something like that. Right, right. But uh, they have a monument um, of a soldier, and he's facing the town, which is kind of weird. Yes. Uh, but it's right in front of the old Meade School, the uh, the Federal Inn Point, the Federal Point Inn, uh-huh. uh, right there at the intersection of West Street, Chambersburg, and Buford Avenue. Um, and then they have a monument, not too many people see, out where they camped and where they saw Gordon's men. It's uh, it's just beyond Knoxland Ridge where the first shot markers fired. Yeah, you go downhill a little bit. It's on the right side of the road. Uh, a lot of people miss it. No kidding. Yeah, you haven't seen that? No. Oh, I'll have no, to go see that. I had no that. idea that was there. You, you, yeah, yeah, let's June, go do it. it. June 26th on it, and it says 26 Pennsylvania Emergency. Oh, I'll be glad to show you no that No kidding. Sometime. I'd love to see that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Let's it's it's that. near the bridge. It's near the bridge down there in Marsh Creek. No shit. Yeah, we'll have to do that. I had no clue. Oh, good. I love showing people this. Okay, good. Yes. I love being shown things for the first time. So that'd be great. Um, all right. Well, so that was interesting uh, about... And he, has, he, has he... No, but I, I, I did some cursory... Searching on Google, and uh, they're part of Cars Brigade. Okay. So okay. The 26th Pennsylvania. Yeah. So yeah. they're fighting up along the Emmitsburg Road there yeah. on day two. Um, oh, well, so then maybe, they, would that be the second division? Is that the second division of the Third Corps? Yeah, it is. Yeah. First Brigade, second division, Third Corps. So that's why he was asking about that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Martin Husk. Uh, he says, I've heard a lot about, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of debate of the exact location of Smith's Battery on July 2nd's fight at Devil's Den. Can you shed light on the location of the two sections supported by the 124th New York Infantry? 
My understanding is originally they were along the stone wall west of their current position where the artillery pieces are located today, um, right at Devil's Den near the witness tree. And that when the Confederates came up the hill through what is the triangular field today, that they were uh, pushed back to the crest of the ridge. There was one section that was detached. They had six guns, apparently. Mm. And two of them were sent down um, uh, the Plum Run Valley, uh, Crawford Avenue. So if you ever come up Crawford Avenue, like you're coming toward Devil's Den, Mm -hmm. and you see those two guns on the right side pointed toward Devil's Den on the south, that's part of Smith's battery. The rest of the guns are the four guns that you see up there uh, at the crest of Devil's Den, or just north of the rocks of Devil's Den. They're facing uh, to the west. Um, And the the far left one is very close to that witness tree, um, that white oak that's uh, right on top of Delston. Yeah, like where the road gets really curvy. It's right at the top of the hill. When you come out, if you're going around behind Delston and you come up around that witness tree, you make a left hand turn in front of it. The the Smith's guns are right on your right. Mm -hmm. And and they have the uh, battery marker with the soldier on top of the base holding the rammer. Right. That's the one that got vandalized yes, years ago. I remember that. Um, took a head dive right into the pavement. Yeah, never found the guy's head, found the body down by the uh, the wall where the uh, sharpshooters, that famous photo was taken of the sharpshooter. Yeah. That's, they dragged him all the way down there. Yeah. And they had to find another head. And I think they used another statue that they found of a similar monument, made sure. a mold out of it. Yeah. And I, this was, I think, December 2012 when they finally lowered that head. And apparently there was a dramatic moment like, will it fit? Will the head fit on the body? The new head on the original body. And from what I understand, fit perfectly. 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 So it was meant to be. Wow. Yeah. So. I didn't know that about the head. They it's didn't the find second, the head? It's a secondary head. No, they, they never found the head. To my knowledge, they never found it. Bring and, me his head. So wait a second. So they, someone has his head to this day. To, well, yeah, I guess so. Theoretically. Right out of, they sold it for scrap. They sold it I for scrap. I think they went to New, New Hampshire, Philadelphia. They were looking at similar monuments, and they had to find something you know really close to that. And when they did, they made a mold out of it. And that's wow. that's the head that's on there today. I didn't. I had no idea. They did that. Uh, uh, the the Hancock Gate that's that they put on uh, Tawny Town Road. They, they did that with the took eagles. Its head? No, no, no. Oh, no. found other eagles. Yeah, I think it was the 29th PA. Because they've got an eagle on top of their monument. Mm, I think they right. used that one as the mole. I didn't know that, Eric. That's oh. interesting. Yeah, because the, the 29th PA was missing their eagle for a while mm. uh, while they were molding it. Mm. Uh, huh. And then they cast two new ones for. Mm. So for there's the precedent for that? Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, okay. Uh, Matt Shupinski says Curious as to why the bodies buried in the known mass graves on Culp's Hill and other areas have been left there rather than being reinterred into the National Cemetery? Question mark. Well, let's let me let me break this down to you, Jim. Um, are the bodies left in the quote unquote known mass graves? My understanding is there are North Carolinians and Louisianans buried there. Okay. Um, the North Carolinians are apparently uh, in the swale between Lower and Upper Culp's Hill. When you come down off of Lower Culp's Hill or you're coming out of Party Field, you come to the stop sign there, mm-hmm. it's right in front of you. Okay. And there's rocks there. I've heard that supposedly they put those rocks there to keep the bodies from, from surfacing up. And that the Louisianans are in the trees over the earthworks, just behind where the North Carolinians are. I've heard that. I I've, I've, uh, haven't heard a whole lot to refute that. And, and we're not talking about the one that everybody knows is supposedly behind the first Maryland. That little trench there. You're talking further down. Back in the trees that they're clearing yeah. out right now. Like that swale do. where the it, between the 111th and 109th and, Pennsylvania. Yeah. 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 That little yeah. dip right there. That yeah. area. And of course, the, you know, it's the, the National Cemetery is for Union soldiers. So these guys are Confederates, so they're not going to take them and move them up into the cemetery. Um, you know, I've heard stories that as many as a thousand Confederates are still, still out there. buried out there, have never been found. Because you think about it, they were left to be buried by local civilians, and they remained buried out there for almost a decade till 1872, when women in the South hired local workers to dig them up. Well, it's nine years later, <laughs> you know, so yeah. you know you're going to miss an awful lot of them. Sure. Gross. But uh, the point is that uh, they're not in the National Cemetery because they're Confederates. Remember, that's supposed to be and, only for Union yeah. dead. Now, there are people that know that we have since discovered 10 Confederates, quote, unquote, buried by mistake. Right. At the time they were established in the cemetery, the war's still going on. It's supposed to be for United States soldiers. Right. Now, today, we look at those 10 Confederates buried in the National Cemetery as American fighting men. We look at it differently today. But the fact of the matter is the cemetery's been closed since 1972 to burials. Yeah. Right. So, so nobody so. can go in there anymore. It's done. Unless 
they there's a family member or something. Once in a while, you'll see a funeral, but it's usually not Civil War. It's those post Civil War, yeah, you know, World family. War Two in Vietnam. Well, Vietnam's the most interesting is the most yeah. recent. Yeah. So think about it. That's been almost what fifty years. Yeah. yeah. So you'd have to have like a daughter or son that's you know outliving their parents by fifty years in order to be buried with, or a spouse. Sure. And how many are going to outlive their spouse by fifty years to be buried with them? Yeah. So. Only the lucky. Yeah. Only the lucky. <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, Matt, oh, sorry, Mike Kearns says, taking into account Sickles' movement on the second day, was there any section of the Union's famous fish hook formation that was not engaged? Uh, was there such a thing as the safest place on the battlefield as the movie makes light of? <laughs> good question. Wow, Mike. that is a good question. Um, this, well, first of all, if you if you look at the movie and they talk about uh, Chamberlain being behind the Union Center, it's it's not right behind the Second Corps in right. the area where Meade's headquarters is. It's more between um, uh, what's it's it like the area of the New Jersey Monument. Exactly, right? yeah. that, that's exactly it. Thank you. I was trying You're to think welcome. of the farm, um, Weikert, Weikert Farm, Joseph yes. Weikert Farm. Right. No, not but, Joseph. George. 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 It's well. George it's, it's, it's a Weikert. Farm. It's yeah. a Weikert. And, and you're exactly right. It's those yeah. trees that are where the New Jersey Brigade marker is located, and that head south uh, on that ridge toward uh, the uh, Cedric Equestrian Monument. Yeah, that's the idea. Real, really, where they were. Where they were, and so what was going on there? Uh, well, you know, it's the second day. So well, uh, yeah, actually, what is he? What is he talking about here? So well, he says they weren't. He's really, asking about the second day. Second day, that weren't yeah. that were kind of safe. Uh, you'd have to, well, given the fact that the Confederates attacked the ends of the fish hook on day two, then you'd have to say probably Cemetery Ridge or Cemetery Hill. But the problem with that is they're under artillery fire, mm -hmm. so it's not completely safe there. If I had to be posted somewhere on day two in the Union line, Westminster. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Washington, West Frederick, somewhere like yeah, that's, yeah. That's a good point. That's where I'd want to be. Um, I'm thinking maybe maybe Cemetery Hill. You yeah. know, there's not a lot of direct at, fire at that it. point. But uh, later on, on, well, no, the next day you don't want to be there, right? Because of the bombardment. Yeah. But we're talking the second. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I would want to be. More, no, it was no. the night of the second though, wasn't that the assault on East Cemetery Hill? Yes, it was. Yeah. That's East Cemetery so, Hill. I would, oh. <laughs> Move me a little oh, over to the okay. left. Okay, so you're talking about <laughs> yeah. like w w where well, the National Cemetery is now we're, we're, and the Bryan Farm yeah. and Ziegler's Grove, there that area. Go. There, there you okay. go. Okay, there I go. gotcha, I gotcha. Yeah, that seems like that would be the, the safest place. Well, you're not on direct infantry attack, but you're under some artillery. Yeah. So the whole line is pretty much under attack. But the main attacks on day two came on the flanks uh, of, the, of the fish hook, Culp's yeah. Hill, yeah. on the right east of the Baltimore Pike, and, uh, you know, all the good stuff on the left, Wheatfield, Devil's Den, Peach Orchard, a little how, around top. How about Powers Hill? Hey, that's a good one. That's well, a good I didn't one. think about that. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of in the middle of the fish yeah. hook. I mean, the, but, yeah. the, the Fifth Corps is in reserve there mm -hmm. uh, for a little while. Might be the safest place. Well, I would have to say so, yeah. yeah. But, there, but, pretty, but there are overshoots. Good. But Remember you're elevated. Not, about if you're the on, not if you're on the, the south side of the hill, there's not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If good you're on point. the south face of that hill, you're yeah, good. You're good there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd have to agree. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I mean, there were overshoots where we are right now, where the current business sure, sure, is. Yeah. Well, well, that's the thing. We were, um, we, we did an interview with um, uh, Ron Kirkwood. Yeah. The Spangler Farm, right? Yeah. Ron Kirkwood um, about the Spangler Farm. And uh, he, you know, because he wrote a book, Too Much for Human Endurance. The 11th Corps Hospital? That uh, yeah. Spangler Farm? Yeah. Not on Hospital Road? Yeah. George Spangler, right? Out on Hospital Road. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and and so today, you know, driving through, the, like, I never realized how close that is to everything because you can't see anything when you're there because of the trees. But we got to remember, like, we have more trees now than they did back then. Right. And so you can't, but there is an account in the book um, of soldiers watching Pickett's charge yeah. from there. Now, he thinks they might be up on a rooftop or something. Almost have to. You know, and maybe they're not seeing the whole, they're not seeing the charge come across. They're seeing the fighting on the ridge. They're probably seeing the smoke. Yeah. Cannonballs exploding. And overshoots yeah. are coming and hitting them. Yeah. And, and that's what uh, you don't realize until you actually look at it on a map and you go, oh, yeah, that is pretty close. And if you take away the trees, you, you'll, you'll see even, you know, 
even more how much closer it is. We're, we're supposed to go out there and do another show from there, right? So that we can actually see this, right? Yeah, here in a couple of weeks. Actually. Yeah, good, good. A year in a couple of weeks? Oh, here, oh, here in, in a, a couple, couple of weeks. weeks. Good. Yeah. Oh, here? Not out on... We're going to go out to the George Spangler farm and do a show from there in a couple of weeks. <laughs> My boy's got the down dog. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Andy Hunt. It seems that many of the missed opportunities for a more complete Confederate victory on July 1st are due to subpar performances by a couple of divisions in Ewell's Corps. Rhodes' uncoordinated attack, Johnson's inability to take Culp's Hill. In your opinion, which misstep was the most significant? And then the follow-up question is, what was Yule's relationship with his division commanders? Well, those are two big questions. Jim, who do you blame for 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 the Confederate loss besides George Meade? Well, are we talking about just the first day? So you said it was missed. He's saying July first, like yeah. subpar, subpar performances by a couple of divisions in Yule's Corps, Rhodes and Johnson. Well, Rhodes didn't have his best day. At Gettysburg, but I mean, don't forget uh, when when Ramser showed up and he put the reserves in, um, he drove the Union forces back. Um, like I said earlier in that earlier question, we we're talking about Iverson's men uh, being impetuous. Um, you know, Rhodes was anxious to get his men into the fight, um, and and they were so scattered. I mean, Doles is way over supporting Gordon on the Carlisle Road, mm-hmm. way over on the left. Uh, we talked about O'Neill. His men advanced through the McLean farm and got repulsed. Iverson got bushwhacked and basically uh, butchered. Daniel's brigade is way over on the right. They go down and get involved in the fight along the uh, the Chambersburg Pike. Yeah. They get involved in that uh, western fight, right. uh, west of town. So <clears throat> I don't uh, blame Rhodes so much for that. It's hard to blame uh, early uh, division commander. Uh, they overlapped the Union right. He doesn't um, blame early. He he. Johnson is the one. Well, Johnson doesn't even get here until the end of the there. day. He got <laughs> bogged down behind Longstreet's men in the mountains and doesn't even get here until it's practically dark. And by then, the guys are exhausted. Right. And I've never really uh, blamed Yule. Um, I've talked about this on tours. Um, Yule is new to, new to command. And um, well, we talk about the hierarchy. You know, you've got Jackson under Lee, who has commanded these troops up until this point. Now he's been dead for two months and he is given a lot of leeway by lee go out the shenandoah valley clear the yankees how you do it's up to you okay mm-hmm. he's out of the equation now you've got yule who fought under jackson now answering directly to lee okay take those hills if if practicable but don't bring on, bring on a general engagement right well, <laughs> what the heck <laughs> is what is what's been going on here all day if it's not a general engagement for crying out loud <laughs> right. so you got yule who's used to taking very specific orders from jackson uh, now all of a sudden taking orders directly from lee that are very general in nature well you mm. got to give lee a break i mean he was looking for his lost chicken <laughs> that's right he's got other concerns of a more pressing nature there is no time <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't blame Yule. I, I, we look back today and we say, oh, if Yule's guys had pushed forward, uh, you know, we could have, that was the best chance the Confederates had. And I would say that's probably true in the battles, best chance they had. But he doesn't know. He doesn't know yeah. what's on East Cemetery Hill, or Cemetery, Culp's Hill, or what's behind them. And people say, well, what if, what if Jackson had been here? Would he have pushed forward? I don't doubt it. He was that aggressive. But the question is that we'll probably never know is would he have been successful? But would he have had the yeah. same situation? To deal with, this is every, like, are, are people usually saying if nothing else was different except Jackson was in command of the Second Corps, well, what would what would have happened? Is I that think what that's they're usually? I think that's usually the premise of. Oh, okay, of because I go, well, how do you know that we would even be here if Jackson was alive? Sure. Well, if you assume that they would have made it to Gettysburg, I don't think the first day would have gone any differently. Johnson's division is still out there. They they right. they, they they're, they're not going to be able to be utilized that day. So you got two divisions. And in the end, you know, they did push through the town. I mean, Jackson's men still would have been broken up by the buildings of the town, the formations. Uh, gathering prisoners would have 
Uh, they would still had to get everybody together again to, in order to make an attack. It was getting late. They were exhausted. They marched 10, 15 miles and fighting all day long. That's not going to change anything. But but Johnson, so, so and on all this stuff here too, like you, like you pointed out, it's Johnson got there late in the day. Yeah. They had been marching all day. Yeah. They were stuck in a traffic jam. Right. You know, just driving in a traffic jam is exhausting. Standing and marching in a traffic jam is exhausting too. And the too. heat, the humidity. The yeah. heat, the humidity. Um, <clears throat> It's getting dark, right? Um, and uh, Early's division put up a good fight. They had marched to the battlefield, and it's just as hot where they were as it is where Johnson was. So, I mean, there's these guys are exhausted. Right? They don't know what's out there ahead of them. There's there's a threat possibly over on their left. Yule is he? You know, I mean, it's like I don't know anybody that would have done anything different. Totally agree. Yeah, because you got to look at the circumstances that they had. And don't forget about the confusion in the town. You're busy gathering up Union soldiers as prisoners, about 4,000 of them. So your formations are completely broken oh, yeah. up as you're going from house to house. Yeah. So now you got to get everybody back together again in a place where all these buildings are. It's kind of hard to form in the streets uh, and form an attack. And it's just, um, you can look back at it from 2020 hindsight and, and say that was the best chance the Confederates had. But uh, you have to look at the way Yule saw it at the time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I think Jackson you know, probably would have pushed forward, knowing his aggressive nature. But once again, the question is, would he have been successful pushing these guys through town and trying to take those heights, um, Cemetery Hill, Culp's Hill, on the first? Now, the Union Army, we also know, was pretty exhausted. Mm-hmm. We, we just don't know. We yeah. don't know what would happen. Have you read an environmental history of the Civil War? No, I have not. Oh, you got to read it. It's great. But the lesson that book teaches you is, first of all, it wipes away the romance of the war, of any war, but the Civil War specifically. Like, there's nothing romantic about it. As my good friend Karen said after reading the book, she goes, I basically came to the conclusion that Virginia was basically a giant poo carpet because of all the manure from the animals and the the men and, you know, all this stuff. It was just disgusting. But there's a lot more to the book than that. But my point is that the lesson I got out of it was it's the little things, not the big things in a battle or in a war that add up to a bigger thing. And so you're talking about, you know, all the stuff that uh, uh, Yule's Corps uh, and the Confederates in general, uh, as they're coming through the town and rounding up the prisoners and all that jazz. It's not like... uh, you know, the the Union fell back and and uh, uh, retreated to through the town and all you know hold up on the hill, and the Confederates went right after them. And it was just this big like you know evacuation of Union troops and moving in of Confederates. No, there were Union troops still there. There were pockets of resistance. There was all this stuff that they had to contend with, and it's those little things that cause the bigger problem. And so Yule had a lot of little things to deal with that caused the bigger problem of not taking that hill. But the way we like to simplify everything for history, and you know, especially with the movie, as, as much as I love the right. movie, you know, as a, as the the first thing that we see and the first thing that that teaches us anything about the battle. And if you're anything like me, when you first saw it, you watched it twenty, thirty thousand times. Um, it's hard to take those notions out of your head when you actually look at the nitty gritty of all these stories and see, OK, there's a lot more to it than, you know, it just wasn't practicable. And, you know, Trimble's whole thing where he's yelling at, uh, you know, and he said nothing like that whole scene. We don't we, you know that that's uh, that's a, that's a good scene to show and everything. But it wasn't that simple. It wasn't that simple as Trimble in the movie makes it out to be. There was a lot that Yule had on his shoulders that he had to consider before doing what Trimble wants him to do. That's right. But when you don't read, you, know, you got to read. So that's why I'm always saying, people, you got to read these books. And he's brand new to Corps Command. Yes. At this point, before Lee re- reorganized his army prior to Gettysburg, um, Yule is commanding a division of about 8,000 men. And now he's commanding a corps of about 20,000 men. Yeah. So between two and three times larger. But I don't think that had anything necessarily to do with what, what went on the first day. I just think that, uh, you know, I think it all goes back to what, uh, what Shelby Foote said in uh, his uh, series 
um, about Gettysburg. He entitled it uh, the chapter um, Stars in Their Courses. And he said, at Gettysburg, the stars in their courses were aligned against Lee. You know, all kinds of brilliant things that occurred in other battles. A.P. Hill showed up just in time at Antietam on just the right place. Um, you know, and, and Gettysburg's a different situation. Um, Lee is in a situation with the, the resources and the men that he has that if the war goes on much longer, um, you know, he's forced to gamble and he's eventually you're going to lose. Yeah. And uh, it caught up to him here at Gettysburg. Yeah. So real quick, mm. uh, Andy Hunt, the guy who asked yeah, that question, sure. uh, clarified some things. Uh, he said, the basis of my question is that David Martin contends that you will fully expected Johnson to take the hill and was disappointed to find out that he didn't. Uh, but the Johnson's contact with elements of the 7th Indiana caused him to reassess. Thanks again. Great episode. Um, Thanks, yeah, Andy. I, so that's a great point. Yeah, exactly. They, they they run into the skirmish line of the 7th Indiana, who happen to be the only people on the hill at the time, but they don't know that. They don't that. know that, That's yeah. exactly we, right, Eric. We they get that. the impression that the whole hill is yeah. heavily fortified. They just happened to hit the wrong spot on the hill where there were Union soldiers. Yeah, it gives you this impression. Uh, exactly. There's a skirmish line that runs all the way from the, the peak of the hill down to Rock Creek. They don't know that it's exactly one regiment right. on that skirmish line and it's the whole regiment <coughs> on that skirmish right. line and that there's nobody behind them because in in civil war tactics if there's a skirmish line there's somebody behind it uh because it's there for a reason eric why isn't the camera on you while you're talking because i don't like well, the camera people want to see me. you eric no they don't you almost got a dan butterfield for this point about oh the seventh God. indiana but i'm taking it away because your face wasn't on the camera go <laughs> ahead here's my Awesome well, now face. nobody wants to see oh, it. We yeah, want to see when is. you're talking. Go to Jim now. He's going to speak. Yep, hide what your am children. I, speak I don't know. It looked like you were going to talk. <laughs> no, I was just wondering where the camera was. Uh, right here. Right in front of you. Oh, there's a camera. <laughs> the whole time his camera's been on me. I was, I thought that was it up there. Oh, no, no, that's no, the no. overhead. Yeah. There's all kinds of cameras. <laughs> yeah, this is cameras. Well, you guys should have told me that before we started. Oh, <laughs> I thought you knew it was right in your face. <laughs> no, it's just a black piece of equipment. Yeah. <laughs> now I know. <laughs> uh, we got one more here. Chris Whitmore. Can you briefly discuss the involvement of the 5th Florida from Perry's Brigade of Anderson's Division? I like this. We don't really talk about the, the Florida troops too much. <laughs> don't know too much about it. Um, but you're right. Florida only had three regiments. Perry's Brigade, 700 men. And they're only going to fight on the second and third day. And they're going to lose 445 casualties, which I've always thought was amazing because, you know, if we talk about even in Civil War context, which uh, the casualties seem to be blown out of proportion, 50% is, is crazy. Iron Brigade, what, 50%? They, they yeah. suffered so badly. These guys lost 445. Uh, 50% of 700 is 350. These mm. guys lost almost 100 guys more than 50%. Yeah. Uh, and, and basically, they're supporting Pickett's Charge on the right. Um Got involved a little bit on the second day as well, um, moving up toward the Emmitsburg Road there. Uh, so they paid a terrible price. Uh, Florida had a limited presence here, but boy, they made their uh, their presence felt. Yeah, this is, it's interesting though because you don't really hear a lot about them in the in the overall story. Nope. But they dedicated their monument a hundred years um, after the battle on June first, nineteen sixty three. Mm -hmm. So, and and if I recall, because so you know monuments always come up and everything, and when they were dedicated and and all the politics of those days and. And everything, but uh, if I recall, the 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 message at the uh, dedication of the Florida Monument was a lot more like liberal. It was more open, like, "Hey, everybody, retire down here." It's not exactly that, but you know, it was it was a lot uh, less uh, it was pro a lot segregation. More conciliatory. It was conciliatory. It was uh, you know, uh, everybody's welcome in Florida type of stuff. I don't remember it exactly, but come on uh, down. We got swamp land for cheap. Exactly, we got swamp land for cheap. We just built a big theme park, and someday all you Yankees might want to retire here for the weather. And they were right. And they were right. They were right. <laughs> my aunt, my, my aunt moved down there. Uh, <laughs> my mom's thinking of it. You know, Katie's mom moved down there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, hey. Okay. So, any any other uh, questions in there while we uh, before we go? Not really, and we're kind of at the end of our time. What do you mean our time? Oh, because well, Jim's, Jim's got to go. go. He's yeah. got a tour. I got a 1230 That's bus. That's right. All right. Well, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, 
Uh, thank you all. Uh, what we'll do is we'll let Jim go. We'll, we'll just uh, play a quick little uh, fife and drum song for you here. And then uh, we'll come back and we'll just, I, I want to go through here and see, you know, I saw some of their comments coming through and I just want to go acknowledge a couple things. So we'll, uh, we'll uh, take a little break um, for the Facebook people. But for the uh, podcast people, thanks for listening. And we will talk to you next time. Our hearts so stout have got us fame for soon to spill. From whence we came, wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down, and pay the reckoning on the mail. No man for that shall go to jail from Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down, and pay the reckoning on the mail. No man for that shall go to jail from Gary Owen and glory.